volunteers the opportunity to put their skills to work and see what working for the public interest looks like. Finally, the program coordinators would like to thank the PBSC National Office for their leadership. You have provided us with the tools and support and the guidance to make this program possible, and we're so, so happy uh, and grateful for, for your assistance. I'd like to talk a little bit today about the growth and the cooperation, the collaboration between U of T and Osgood this year. This year has been particularly significant for the Toronto chapters. Both have grown in size and we've collaborated on more projects than ever before. Between Year 15 and Osgoode, we have 315 students volunteering who work on 90 projects across the city in all areas of law. Of those 90 projects, 15 are joint between Year 15 and Osgoode. The majority of these ranked projects work with some of our largest and longest running programs. Over 100 volunteers work on these placements alone. I'd like to highlight a few of our joint ventures as they exemplify some of the great work that PBSC volunteers are doing for the community, as well as demonstrate the high level of cooperation between Oscar and your team. The Family Court Support Worker Program of the Barbara Schleifer Clinic offers assistance in the court to those women survivors of violence who are unrepresented. This year we had eight students from both Osgood and UFT working together in the family law courts to provide assistance. However, this number is set to expand in the future as this has become one of our most successful projects. We also initiated a project with the Wood Green Deck Clinic in, the, in Toronto's East End. Again, eight students from both schools work together to run bi-weekly clinics which provide legal information to low and middle income clients facing bankruptcy and insolvency issues. One of our goals this year was to expand the scope of our program in terms of areas of law in order to address the access to justice issues across the board. Woodbean is a great example of this kind of project and we're so happy that we could start it off this year. I'm going to pass it on to Andy who will continue discussing our fantastic projects. Thank you, Rebecca. I, in addition to those innovative projects that Rebecca just discussed, I'd like to take an opportunity to highlight what we at PDSC call our long-term projects. Our long-term projects are often projects that involve upper-year students directly helping unrepresented litigants in front of various courts and tribunals. These projects would never come into existence or still be going on without the leadership of our national office, but they would also be completely impossible to manage without our family law project coordinators and our volunteer coordinators. Just by way of an example, this year our family law project had over 50, year, 50 upper year students from both U of T and Osgoode volunteering in four family courts across the city, and they worked under the leadership of Catherine Marchamp from U of T and Maria Kekov from Osgoode. Another example is that PBSC expanded its partnership this year with Pro Bono Law Ontario. Uh, between our two schools, we had over 30 up year students volunteering at the Law Help Ontario centers at both the Superior Court and the Small Claims Court. And without the help of our U of T volunteer coordinator, Paul Davis, the training and coordination, recruitment of those volunteers would have been absolutely impossible. Um, we have way too many projects to adequately address them all or to even list them all, so I'd really just like to say, once again, that we're grateful for the dedication of our volunteer coordinators and our partners and volunteers who have demonstrated unwavering commitment to their placements this year and have really made it a present exciting year in terms of all of our long-term projects. Hello, everyone. 
And finally, we would like to thank um, one of our biggest supporters, Matt Kelleher. Uh, Matt is a business law partner here at McCarthy Tetro and uh, a member of the firm's pro bono committee. Matt has been a friend of PBSC for many years, and his commitment to our program is truly unparalleled. Two years ago, Matt was integral in launching a very innovative project called the McCarthy Tetro Public, Public Interest Project, um, where three students assist McCarthy lawyers on some of their pre-existing pro bono files. Last year, I was extremely fortunate to be one of the first three students to be on this project. And uh, one of the things that really struck me about the experience was how dedicated the lawyers are here to pro bono and to ensuring that organizations, um, as a, pardon me, that an organization that assists the most vulnerable members of, of our community um, are, are receiving quality legal, legal services. And so Matt, thank you so much for being the best friend and supporter that PBSC could possibly ask for. The help that you and other members of McCarthy's family provide to PBSC um, is to a large extent the catalyst that makes our access to justice mandate flourish. So thank you very much. Um, please join me now in welcoming Matt Keller. Well, that was a very nice welcome. So uh, just on behalf of the entire firm, I just want to take a minute to thank you all very much for all of your hard work and to welcome you very sincerely to the firm today. We're thrilled to have you here. For us, we have a, a flourishing pro bono program in the firm that spans all kinds of practice areas and all kinds of lawyers in Toronto and right across the country. But there's something special about Pro Bono Students Canada and there's something special about this event every year that gets us really excited. And we're thrilled to share in this event that's really about, about you guys, about uh, celebrating the work you've done and the achievements you've had over the past year. So welcome, thank you, congratulations. We're thrilled to have you here and, uh, and to share in your success. As I say, McCarthy's has a long-standing uh, tradition of pro bono work in the firm. Uh, in addition to providing financial support to Pro Bono Students Canada, more importantly, our lawyers provide uh, supervision to some of the pro bono projects that are going on in all of the PBSC chapters across the country, or at least many of them, especially where our firm has offices. Uh, we're very proud of our partnership. Um, without any doubt in our minds, Pro Bono Students Canada is the best organization of its type in the country. We just have no question about that, and we're very, very proud to be with you uh, as you uh, carry out this journey. You, you truly have the best leadership. You attract the best student volunteers who are here today with us, and, and by far you have the biggest impact of any organization like this that we see. So we're very proud to be alongside you, and, and you're just very, very good at doing what you do. Um, and of course, it goes without saying, we're thrilled to work with so many talented students every year. It, um, it just brings a lot of energy into our firm. We're uh, you know, very excited to think, see the things that you're doing, and, and you just invigorate our pro bono program, so, so thank you for that. Um, and again, uh, you know, this event is a real highlight for us, so uh, we appreciate you being here, and, and we're thrilled to host you today. But my real job today is to introduce a couple of special guests we have with us. Uh, first, we have with us, uh, and we're very proud to have with us, uh, a member of our provincial parliament, Laurel Broughton, who's here in the front row. <laughs> Ms. Broughton was first elected to the Ontario Legislature in 2003, and was then re-elected with great support in 2007 and 2011. She was very recently, in 2013, appointed as the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, and I asked what that was about, and she told me what she tells her young children, and that's government's branches talking to one another. So <laughs> that's a good way for me to understand it as well, that uh, a young child can understand it. Um, uh, she's also the minister responsible for women's issues, so we applaud, uh, applaud you on, on International Women's Day as well, and all the great work you're doing in that area. Um, just as one of her many initiatives, and, and the list is very long, I assure you, uh, that she's done in, in, in the interest of women and children. She conducted a province-wide consultations that led to the government's introduction of uh, a domestic violence action plan and the sexual violence action plan, with both with great success. Uh, Laurel uh, earned her undergraduate degree from McMaster University and her law degree from the University of Western Ontario. Uh, so I'm proud to also have gone to that school with you. Um, uh, she articled at the Supreme Court of Canada with Justice LaRue Dubay, 
and who we will hear from this afternoon. So thank you and welcome. Uh, also, we have uh, Mr. Justice Jim Farley here as well, or James Farley, I should say. <laughs> Mr. Justice Farley is a Queen's Counsel and was appointed to the Superior Court in 1989. Since its inception in 1991 and until his retirement in 2006, Justice Farley acted as the supervising judge of the commercial list in Toronto. So as many of you know, that's the branch of the court that handles very complex corporate and commercial litigation and insolvency matters. He's also a graduate of the University of Western Ontario and also the University of Oxford where he obtained his bachelor's degree and a master's degree and was a Rhodes Scholar as well. Jim completed his law degree at the University of Toronto and we're very proud to say that since 2006 he has become senior counsel at our firm where he provides our clients with uh, strategic advice in a, in a range of issues from business law to litigation and insolvency matters. And he's a very close friend to all of us and a, and a, and a real presence in our firm. So we're thrilled to have Jim with us today. And, and finally, uh, Dean Sawson is with us, of course. Um, Lauren Sawson became Dean of Osgoode Hall Law School on July 1st, 2010 to be very specific about it. <laughs> For eight years prior to his appointment, he was a professor, a professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto, and he's also a for the former Associate Dean of the University of Toronto and served as the inaugural director of the Center for the Legal Profession. Previous to that, Dean Sawson was a faculty member at Osgoode Hall Law School and the Department of Political Science at York University. Dean Sawson was also a law clerk to former Justice Antonio Lemaire of the Supreme Court of Canada and a former associate at the, uh, of law at Columbia Law School and a former litigation lawyer at the firm of Gordon Ladner Gervais. And in addition to those many accomplishments, um, I also know that uh, Dean Sawson is a, is a strong supporter of Pro Bono Students Canada, Pro Bono Initiative generally. And, and you talk about great friends of Pro Bono Students Canada, I think uh, Lauren is probably the strongest one of all. So we're thrilled to have you here today, and I'll turn it over to you for the, for the final introduction. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, very much, and thanks to everyone at McCarthy's for um, putting on this event, and of course to PBSC and all those who work behind the scenes and in front of the scenes to organize these uh, events and make them so hugely successful, and even more so to all the students uh, who are here, partners, funders, special luminaries, uh, and of course to um, someone I'll always refer to as Justice uh, Claire Lulu Dubay, and we'll be hearing from her, and I'll introduce her in a moment. But um, those of you who know me will know that uh, it's quite a special occasion for me to pull out the purple vest. I do it uh, <laughs> rarely. And the International Women's Day, getting a chance to be on, uh, you know, in a discussion with uh, Justice Lugo Dubay, a chance to celebrate uh, pro bono and the people who make it happen, and more importantly, the theme that you've already been hearing about uh, of the uh, the connecting of this community. And I, I'm the human manifestation of the U of T Osgood collaboration, and <laughs> it is. Uh, you know, wonderful to have seen these initiatives from different perspectives. When you see it around the Law Foundation table, for example, or talking to McCarthy's associates, everyone is going to have a different, or Thomson Reuters, and, and the many supporters who all have a different lens on the issue. The students who want to get experience, who want to uh, be able to see law in action, the schools that want to be able to be a part of making a positive difference, the organizations, but no one loses sight of uh, the clients, the communities affected by this work, the reason that everyone is excited to get up in the morning to be a part of these initiatives. And I think that's really what brings us all together when we put aside whether it's public or private or this school or that school. Uh, there's no partisanship when you're involved in something you really care about. And I hope that's a message uh, we all take from here uh, onwards. And I think that's also uh, uh, theme for Justice uh, Claire Lugo Debate because the reason I got to know her, as you heard, I wasn't her clerk. Um, I was another judge's clerk, but uh, we had the same uh, taste in um, uh, low rent breakfasts in the cafeteria downstairs at the Supreme Court, and I'd uh, see her um, 
in the midst of uh, conversation, which would normally be a signal not to sit down and chat, but I realized quickly she was having a conversation with the op-ed page of the paper she was reading, not with anyone else, and that was a great invitation to sit down and uh, hear a bit about uh, what uh, she was passionate about that morning, and of course her kindness and her compassion very quickly become uh, something that crosses boundaries, whether of clerk's chambers or of afterwards when you need to call on her for advice or support, and she is uh, always there. So uh, there's a, a kind of parlor game that you start uh, to, uh, to take on when someone has been so much a part of the justice system as Justice uh, Luda Bay has, and that is when you meet someone new, just as a bit of a test of are we going to have any kindred energy, you start asking, so what's what's the Lagoa de Bay decision that you are most affected by? And depending on what they say, you sort of have learned everything you need to know about the person you're about to connect with. Uh, so I'm going to start our discussion from here and then continue it uh, from there with a question that um, will be harder. But the easy question for me when I'm asked, what's, what's the one I'm most affected by, uh, is a decision many of you will take if you take in administrative law, those students in the class, and that's the Baker decision. Uh, from 1999 and the reason it's uh, so uh, lasting and its impression on me is not that uh, Justice Lita DeVay was writing for a unanimous court, that happened actually more than people think, uh, and it wasn't that she had reshaped, uh, synthesized and moved forward the law in a complex and important area, that happens more often uh, than, than people think and I think everyone's field will be shaped in some way by a decision whether majority dissent or otherwise. Uh, but it's this, to take an idea like compassion and turn it into a legal value, which is the essence of what I take that case to have been about, looking at the humanitarian and compassionate leave provisions of a, an immigration act and how they can be exercised and what the animating features uh, are when uh, looking at that kind of frontline discretion and the impact it has on some of our most vulnerable members of our community uh, is something that stays with me. I come back to it. Uh, it's got that beautiful combination of very practical wisdom you can take on the road and sweeping thoughts about the aspirations of what a justice system can be. Uh, and so uh, when people ask me that when they stop me on the street, and they do more often than you think, I say uh, uh, it's a uh, and I'll be curious to hear uh, what others were moved by. But in a seamless bit of stage management, I'm now going to move to the chair and pose <laughs> the first hard question. But as I do, uh, let me uh, again give you the basics uh, of uh, what you uh, likely already know a bit of in uh, Justice Luga Bay's career. Because uh, it's come to my attention uh, in uh, ways that I have to say I always am surprised by people in their first year of law school. Uh, and you should be a little bit embarrassed by this, I don't know if you are, I really view you as a bit of a rock star. <laughs> now you know, we're having special guests this no year. One. You know, I mean, it's, uh, there's a bit of a Mick Jagger complex. <laughs> the more the allure. But it was, uh, for some of us in the room, not that long ago, in 1951, that you were the star of Laval's graduating class uh, in law school, called to the bar in 1952, uh, a very um, active, diverse, and clearly influential number of years in practice, I think 20, 21 years in practice until uh, 1973, I think was your first appointment uh, to uh, <coughs> the trial court in Quebec, Superior Court, and then uh, in 1979 to the Court of Appeal in Quebec, 1987 to the Supreme Court of Canada, where uh, she, um, uh, of course, had a profound effect, as I was saying, on diverse areas of law until her retirement in 2002, at which point she was uh, then the most senior uh, justice on the court and uh, active with the International Commission of Jurists, with uh, a host of uh, legal organizations, internationally, domestic, more honorary doctorates, uh, awards, and prizes than would make sense to read out to you, but uh, it is uh, it is a list one should never take for granted either. We always say, needs no introduction, long list of awards, but when you're actually in this role and you have to read through them because you want to be current, uh, it is actually quite astonishing. And if you're the person who's the face of our justice system around the world, and for many you are, you're the first person they meet from Canada, I think we couldn't possibly be doing any better. 
So before the first question, let's first have a welcome for Justice Cleo. So next day in the papers, I think Harold, whatever it was, said that I had a well rehearsed Hebrew. <laughs> for that. And welcome, and that really goes to uh, Rabbi Gunther Plout. Uh, <laughs> asking me to be somewhere, having trained me for my bar mitzvah. <laughs> So I promised uh, the first question was going to be a tougher one for you. The easy one is, what's your favorite decision? What's the best decision in your view? What's the one that you think of most fondly? But I wanted to start off uh, with, in fact, the opposite question. What's the decision as you reflect on, on uh, you know, uh, decades, really, uh, of jurisprudence that you either helped shape or was a, a part of that troubles you, that stays with you, and uh, uh, that you think about uh, not in a in a way that makes you feel satisfied or content, but in a way that at least makes you uh, come back to and revisit in, in your own mind. Well, the worst, the the, the the decision I am most unhappy with or disappointed with just happened after I left. And <laughs> 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 I'll tell you a couple awesome. of them. One, one of them was the decision, uh, you would know the, the, the citation, but uh, it's, it's written by Justice Binning about this, these, and it's a good day to, to mention that. These women in Newfoundland that were stolen $5 million by their employers because they were underpaid or not paid the same for the work of the same value, so they won all the way, the $5 million. I think it was, it was not billions, it was $5 million. And they went to, to the court, they won every arrived at the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court tells the government, well, if that was the, the pretense of the government, if you have no money, well, you don't pay. So for me, it, it was heartbreaking to see that a government has priority. They can always find the five millions per. Secondly, the academic said they didn't have even a, a good evidence that they didn't have the money. But thirdly, they could have said you pay next year, you pay the year after. So that was to me a very great disappointment because the women had won for so long they were before the courts and then at the end they come and, and that's the answer. Well, so there's actually a line in that case that uh, it was never meant, of course, to be, uh, uh, it was never meant with offense, but I've, I come back to it and it's it's hard to read without feeling a bit of that uh, righteous indignation because it refers to the priorities of um, schools and hospitals and roads. Mm -hmm. Now I think if you mention schools and hospitals, I think everyone is kind of with you on the challenge of pay equity or emergency rooms. The minute you introduce highways uh, and bridges, it's very hard to put that up against equality, social justice, these other values. So. Uh, it, it is one that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think is, uh, stays with many people who uh, read it. I think the court uh, is, and was, certainly was, um, very reluctant to deal with social economic issues because they're not men men mentioned in the, uh, in the charter. So to come to the, to the decision while I was there uh, was bustling. Thus, there is also another problem of social economic. Uh, it's a simple case. Uh, uh, Quebec uh, made a special effort to give to put the pe poor people, people with no work, on on the on the, on the work uh, side, and everybody in the court said this is fine. The, 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 it's perfectly logical and, and correct for a, a province to try to find programs for people to work rather than get uh, money. But uh, this lady 
uh, fell between the cracks. And she had to prostitute herself. She couldn't. They, they took away the money for social assistance that she was getting uh, as, as uh, without work. So uh, the majority said, well, the program is OK, it's reasonable. What we said, Louise Arbour, myself, and Basarash, I think, uh, we said, it's fine, but it, there, there shouldn't be anybody falling in the crack. Put the program so that everybody is covered. Otherwise, you cannot let people without nothing. And that woman had to prostitute herself. And the, the story is a very sad story. So uh, to me, uh, that was a very great disappointment. Because it was, it's rare that we have those kinds of cases. And I remember that in South Africa, I was at a panel recently with uh, Justice Sachs, and we were discussing those issues, and he said that in those cases, what they resort to, to force the government to, is the right to life. And that's exactly what we invoked, uh, plus the equality issues. So that's another disappointment. You know, and, and again, I think uh, while everyone could be sympathetic to the concern of you know, vastly rewriting government budgets through uh, you know, well-intentioned interpretations of the Charter. The South African example is a kind of instructive one, where the obligations are always seen through the lens of reasonable efforts. Right? South Africa can't afford to do everything. So the question isn't, mm -hmm. did you do what we might say in downtown Toronto is enough? It's show me the reasonable efforts that recognize the rights underlying it. And it is uh, an element of that um, uh, dissent uh, that I, I come back to uh, is where the right to life, liberty, and security of the person became rooted in criminal justice. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Justice Aurora, uh, I forget it may have been uh, you together, or I, I think mm -hmm. of it as something I know she's spoken of, uh, has this line about where in the document uh, are we supposed to read that in? Talks mm -hmm. about legal rights, talks about plain mm -hmm. language. So it's if there's one area that uh, is unfinished business, Mm -hmm. And it's not to say it's, it's been ignored, but you can only leave doors open a crack for so long before people become, uh, I think after 30 some odd years, people will become frustrated. So uh, that's there's a- still, There's still, still another one reason. So that there are many I didn't agree with. <laughs> Zero percent. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll talk about the one that was shocking. The last one, Lola and Eric from Quebec. Uh, this is, uh, a uh, woman, 17 years old, a beauty from Brazil, uh, brought back by, by Mr. La Liberté of the Sec du Soleil to Quebec. She doesn't speak French. They have three children. She accompanies him around the world in his tour and everything. And then he gets tired and he, he picks up another one. And she says, well, well, he pays for the children, of course, $400,000. So, so that's a hard case that makes bad, bad law generally. But I think the court went much beyond that. And so they said, uh, why wouldn't I be entitled to, um, to uh, alimony and then some share of, uh, of the uh, property? Well, the Civil Court of Quebec uh, does not recognize unmarried uh, couples. Uh, not like Ontario, at least uh, if one year together with the child and three years, you have some rights. So the majority, uh, contrary uh, uh, to, to the, the last dissent I made was, was Bono and Roche. So they said Bono and Roche is on the way. Uh, it's no more loss. So my, my dissent was okay. <laughs> uh, but they said in that, uh, in that case that there was discrimination by the Civil Court of Quebec. Uh, against uh, in, in, in a situation which is exactly similar from those of uh, uh, married couples. And since, uh, since then, we've given so many rights to the gays and lesbians. So it's difficult to understand that after saying it's discriminatory, they said it's reasonable. <laughs> so uh, I understand that perhaps they, were not, they wouldn't want to go into Quebec particular uh, situation, but one person, Rosie, <laughs> she, won, she said it's not reasonable because you had other alternatives. You could assume or presume uh, uh, that they, because in my view they didn't touch the right question, but the right question is are they a family and we do want to support <coughs> families. If they are families, I mean it doesn't matter if it's gays, if it's this, if it's that, it's a family. And uh, when women are not given 
what is all due to them for uh, bringing up those children and having them first, the children suffer because there's a dichotomy between the, the life of this. So anyway, to, to say that I'm, I'm not always happy with, with what uh, goes on. And in that particular case, I was so sorry because my bet, uh, luckily I didn't bet a million, mm -hmm. because my bet was that they were at the point of looking at the situation in Quebec where 50, almost 50% 50 of couples uh, live together and everything. Sure. So it was a bit disappointing, but, uh, but Rosie got it. You know, Rosie uh, is a great uh, example of an up and coming rock star. Yeah. 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 She's, she's, great she's always been a rock star. So you've already uh, opened the, the door um, to, the, to the next question, which is, is to come back to, again, that reputation, which uh, maybe is deserved, maybe is less deserved than people think of the great dissenter uh, in the tradition of uh, Brandeis to the south and uh, maybe uh, former Chief Justice Laskin uh, during the Bill of Rights years, but there's that sense in, uh, I think, how students first come across your work, often it's in the impassioned dissents uh, mm -hmm. that they uh, first encounter, uh, I think, the, the values that you carry forward. So as you reflect on the dissents, uh, are there one or two that you think uh, of whose time hasn't come or where you come back to that and say, I thought I was right then, I know I'm right now. Uh, is there a dissent that stays in your mind as, as one that you hope no, people it's will more, come back it's to? No, it's more, the court, the court is coming back to common sense. They, 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 <laughs> I, I'm not, I don't forget anything I did and I did it in the best possible way. I'm a rebel by nature, I, I know that, my parents told me that. <laughs> But I don't accept uh, anything for uh, granted. Um, and I think, personally, first to speak about dissent, you have to speak about men dissenting. Laskin, Spence, and Dixon, eh? right. they were, they called them LSD. They were dissenting <laughs> all the time, and 10 years later, the dissent became law. So that's a tradition in our uh, country. That is wonderful that you can, and in my view, the dissents, the, not probably every, every dissent I could say, but the progressive dissents, the one that see along, along the line what's coming up, uh, are, are, the, are the, uh, the future. It, it's it's the, the, the voice of the future. And it, in so many ways, in my case, but in other cases, it, it's been confirmed. And I had discussion with the Chief Justice of France uh, about this issue. And of course, in France, there's no dissent. And, and Judge Mira went to France to be on an arbitration, and he was dissenting, and he said, I couldn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, for one reason, the stability of law. And I think it's totally ridiculous, <laughs> because the law shouldn't be stable. The law should follow society, and society is not stable. And it's more and more accelerated. So off our back can we stay uh, with the, 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 the stability in question? So I think that. Um, usually, and uh, LSD proved that they had seen along the line. And I remember I was uh, <laughs> I was uh, uh, judging the Jessup at one point with a professor very well known in uh, in Ottawa, Farah, Donna Farah, and uh, the the woman was uh, speaking and explaining a thing, and she quoted one of my dissent. And Farah just come up and said, you know, Adam, this is not the law, this is a dissent. And I said, uh, you are not allowed to quote. And I said, I said, don't worry, it's the law of the future. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, uh, there's another little trick uh, for those in the room who uh, will find themselves on the Supreme Court uh, down the road, and I'm sure that's more than you think. Uh, is uh, when you're then writing for a unanimous court uh, down the road in another decision, just slip in a paragraph, uh, as we said before, and the we meaning the dissenting we, not the majority we, and there's a little piece of that Baker decision that pulls up an earlier case, and I, mm -hmm. I, think, I, don't, I don't recall the case saying that, and of course I went back to it, and the great dissent had said that, <laughs> which then, of course, uh, when it's in a unanimous decision, becomes mm -hmm. the law of the future. So the idea I wrote that, a whole article in France about that. It's, it's yeah. actually... Uh, trying to convince the French. <laughs> too, too much of hope. But it's a great, it's a great statement, though, about uh, the 
you know, the metaphor of the living tree, how law grows, and mm -hmm. I, I hope we never give up uh, dissents, although I know that future chief justices in the room will, uh, will not welcome those moments of trying to bring everyone together. But it, it actually uh, brings up a related question, which uh, on International Women's Day I think is particularly appropriate. And uh, there were a number of decisions in which you found yourself either with the other uh, women on the court or writing for a majority to reverse or give different direction uh, to areas that had been charted really by an all-male court in a different era. Mulligan 1992, I think, is uh, one example. Are there cases like that that you're convinced in retrospect wouldn't have been written the same way by an all-male court? Uh, and you know, we're looking at uh, how many years since um, uh, former Justice Bertha Wilson's uh, talk on uh, will women judges make a difference? And we don't often return to those questions uh, and maybe we should because we're not looking at the first woman on a court or the first decision. But what's the cumulative impact? What wouldn't have been the same had it, a, had it been an all-male panel in a case you participated in? Well, I would say that every person on the court makes a difference, whether a woman or man. Uh, the Sopinka made a big difference. Uh, not to my liking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so everybody makes a difference. Yeah, mustaches haven't really made a comeback. <laughs> <laughs> uh, women have a particular voice. Everybody knows that. Um, when you go to international women uh, play, uh, conferences, we don't deal with the same problem that men do with their, their own conference. We don't deal with press procedure, blah, blah, blah. We deal with human issues, with the children, we deal with um, women's uh, issues, uh, uh, violence against women and everything. So we have a perspective that is different because we are mothers. So there's getting in a set about voices of women who are different. <coughs> So, but in, in, uh, on the court, it, it's the same. You are the same person uh, as you always have been, have been since the birth when you go to the Supreme Court. I mean, you don't change personality because you're a judge of the Supreme Court. And particularly uh, in, the, in the court of last resort, there's many more chances of being uh, rebels and, uh, and uh, dissenters. Why? In the Court of Appeal of Quebec, if I look at my record, I have one dissent a year. Why? Because we all speak the same language. We all Catholics. We have the same social context. We know the same people and everything. So this makes for less different words. But when you arrive at the Supreme Court, there are nine different persons being born different places, different religions, different uh, language, different everything. So it's a kind of normal that there would be uh, more dissents, and that would be uh, a field uh, which is fructueux for, this, for, the, for, the, for dissents. Uh, Justice Sabinka and I were the best friends. I loved him, and my, when my son died, he was the closest, came to uh, But we couldn't understand each other in criminal law. Uh, and the same with Justice Lemaire. It's not that we don't like each other, it's a question of we don't have the same view of things. Uh, in the case of Justice Lemaire, and you know better than me, uh, first I must say I am a great admirer of Beverly Maitwater. I think she's a great Chief Justice. She's a great person, she's bright, she, she is organized like to hear, and I hear from my friends there that uh, the court is a happy one. That was not my case. That was not my case at all. So uh, she has succeeded in doing that. It's not that there's so many less dissent, there are more, there are less conquering opinions uh, in the court. But there are still a lot of dissents, like the last one, Rosie and, and Lola and, and Eric. But I think there is consensus where there should be consensus. And dissents are flowing just uh, like, so she, I don't think she's a, so I, I really think that she, and, I don't know if I should say that, but uh, oh, we're among friends. I'm, I'm, I'm usually frank. Um, <laughs> the the the, Mer the Dixon Court was an extraordinary court. They had an incredible job to do. They they wrote the best decision, Andrews and and the Oaks and the, named them um, because they had to give life to the charter. But then came the Lamer Court, 1990. I was part of it. And, and then he wanted to expand it to the sky. So they lived 
for, we left for a while on, on a kind of uh, uh, tumulus thing, tumulus. <laughs> and uh, what happened after that, you can't go higher, so you have to come down. So what Beverly did was bringing the court to its re reality. And uh, I said, coming back to Earth. And I don't think that I would say it's conservative at all. I think we, uh, the, the, the hopes that uh, built on criminal law, for example, columns, columns have become grant, and grant was my dissent in Stillman, for example. But it's because it was not acceptable. I remember Feeney. You may not, but Feeney was an horrible story where the guy killed an old man and they, he was full of blood and uh, the police arrived and knocked at the door and the door opened and they went in and they, uh, they saw the guy with the blood and the, the, all the, I think the cigarettes of the, of right. his, the one they had killed and everything. So uh, the, 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 the majority, I wrote the dissent, but the majority wrote that they had to, uh, to uh, get this evidence out because they had a way to get a, a warrant. Well, it was in Prudwinter, in Saskatchewan. The church was 300 uh, miles away, something. So, I mean, the guy would have washed his shirt and everything. So, uh, I spoke to a guy, uh, to uh, the Chief Justice of South Africa at the time. I was there for the thing. And he said, Claire, Finney, we couldn't have done that because it would have been a revolt against the court. So you have to calculate to be in symbiosis with, this, with the community. You can't, you can't write things that's so offensive that, that the, the community, it, it's a disrespect of justice. Uh, the, 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 so Beverly has succeeded in keeping the, the, the court healthy, as a, in a sense, in accordance with the community, and so on. So really, it's what happened, and apart from that, you know, there is a limit to elasticate the, the charter. Uh, interpretation, fine, but there's a certain limit. There are areas where the charter hasn't been exploited at all. Poverty is the same, is, is exactly the, that, that issue. And, and, uh, and the violence against women, I did I tried to do my part in uh, not victimizing the victim on the, on the bench uh, 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 during the trial. But we have, the court has not yet tackled the real hard issue on, on those two. Uh, so I think your uh, account uh, answers part of what uh, the, the next question was going to cover, which is. Uh, well, I'm always in it. You are. You're in it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I'll, so I'll just come to the conclusion of that question rather than the lead up. The lead up was that there is a perception of the court being a bolder, more innovative place, a catalyst for change rather than finding that reflective point when change is already underway to, to amplify it. Uh, and especially in those early years of the Charter where so much of the nation's attention uh, was on the court. And there's a sense now, even though some of the decisions are uh, you know, staking out new territory, the government still finds uh, major legislation sometimes mm -hmm. struck down, but there's a sense of cautiousness, of more uh, strategy and uh, awareness of judicial activism, uh, defensiveness mm -hmm. sometimes about the mm -hmm. role of a judge today than one ever heard during those robust early charter years of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, Chief Justice Dixon, as you mentioned. <coughs> Does that resonate? I mean, when, you, when people ask you, uh, do you look to the court as a bold, innovative place today, uh, what would you say? Um, I think that, uh, as I would say, they, they have um, taking the measure of what the Charter can do. Uh, and, and the Charter has accomplished a lot. Whether they will tackle more um, bold questions and go further um, <coughs> depends on who is on the court. And now we have three people, uh, Fish is going out, and right. then uh, uh, Louis Lebel. Exactly. And Louis Lebel was really a leader intellectual. Uh, just like Charles Monti was. Uh, so when you read a person like this, I don't always agree with his uh, decisions, but still is a, is a great intellectual. So all will depend on who comes at the court at that moment. There are people that are the right moment, right place, and everything. There are others that, but Bertha <coughs> Wilson was there for Morgan Teller. She was there for so many of those issues, but who will be there? I don't know the new judge, uh, right now. 
so and, and uh, the others uh, new ones. But it, it depends very much on who is the poet. And Dixon was uh, was uh, adamant that he's, he was going to make the charter uh, a useful instrument for the people. Okay, well, I, I don't know that I trust judges who you don't know yet, so I'm going to wait until you get to know them, <laughs> express a view, and, and then we can make a decision. But let's move uh, away uh, for a moment from uh, the court and, and that judicial um, uh, career to a bit of the reason we're here today, and that's uh, access to justice and the uh, next generation that will take uh, the leadership uh, reins. Uh, I think you know it's an interesting question that I think uh, former Supreme Court justices and first-year law students and associates and partners, everyone in between, should think to themselves how they would answer, and it's this. If you were designing the system, and you could choose between, I love to. and you may, <laughs> whatever it is, I want, I want to be a part of that system. But if you were designing it, and the choice was taxing every lawyer to generate, uh, let's say, $1,000 for a lawyer, and it all goes to a legal aid scheme and pays for experts in poverty law and so forth, if that was choice number one, or a requirement that every lawyer give 100 hours a year or some amount of their time, uh, even in areas where they don't necessarily have expertise, uh, and the amount at the end of the day was going to be a same sum total, which would you prefer and why? Oh, because I mean, it's very good that uh, the bar and, and the, the, the law firm uh, realize that uh, they should contribute to. Uh, to the reason why there's no access to justice because they charge too much. The, 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 the problem is so simple. If a, a, a person of small means would, would uh, go to a firm, whatever, and the firm says, we'll, we'll charge you what you can pay, or would you, there would be no problem with access to justice. That's what I did. That's what my colleagues was reflecting with Jacques Philippe and, and Roger the other day, and we said, my gosh, were we lucky to, to live in a, in a time when, when lawyers were not making money. <laughs> so we could tell the client, well, you pay us when you, uh, so, uh, and, and, and we made money just the same. So the problem that we make it uh, this and this and that, the f basic problem is that the, the, the uh, uh, profession is not accessible, period. To uh, under, uh, knowing that it won't change, uh, at least for the next time. The next best thing is that the lawyers would um, contribute to that in both ways. Uh, I'm, I'm very, I, I think it's extraordinary what McCarthy is doing here, and uh, I saw what he's doing in Montreal. They supported Lawyers Without Border, they, they are supported this pro bono. It's every firm, law firm should do that, that can. Do it. I mean, you pay a thousand dollars. It may be five. It may be ten. I think you just uh, made it to the front page of McCarthy's brochure, by the way. So <laughs> <laughs> no, but you appreciate what they do. I mean, this is. Uh, no, it's it's. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure others are replicating. Like uh, we went to Cavabuzo with right. my former law clerk Stephen Moreau this morning. They are also very open to these uh, to this experience. Uh, I, I remember had uh, Steve, uh, not Stephen, but probably something. Uh, one of my law clerks uh, went after to work at, in New York for uh, Davis, Davis, whatever oh. called. And they gave him three months to go and defend the people in Rwanda. Or in the, uh, so they were very generous. 20% uh, and for, his, uh, for himself, he said 35%. Uh, of his time was counted uh, uh, while he was defending people in Rwanda. So uh, it's, uh, it's um, uh, Scott Requa, you know, you know Scott. Uh, so he was left the, the professional since. But anyway, that was a big. That was much before uh, it was popular here to do to give uh, the lawyers very much the young ones that start give them uh, and um, I always say to young people that. There's nothing bad to put your shingles at the door and work in your community. I think that would be one way that people, they haven't done an experience in the Columbia University with that. They were paying people to stand, they were, um, they were uh, 
firefighters, they were uh, whatever, and they dispensed uh, the, the law in their community. And the, and the law school would pay that. I said, did you hear about that? I think I read that at one point. I said, my gosh, this is wonderful. Their communities would, would benefit a lot from people from the community giving back to the community, being helped in some way, if necessary, because uh, when you serve the people, they pay you what they, they, they can pay. And this, there's no, uh, we, we don't get the certificate of law in order to earn $100,000 the first year and 300 and more. I think we have to come to basic in that. Law is, uh, uh, is a service to the people. Basically, we are a professor. We are not a business. I have nothing against people who go into law to serve the big communities, the big uh, uh, firms, and everything. That's fine with me. But there has to be people who look after people. And that's very important. So, so let me uh, take uh, that point um, uh, one step further and give you a chance to get on the uh, brochure of PBSC as well. Uh, and it's this. When you add up all that, uh, and I think it's, it's clear that the leadership of firms and, and others and partners also wouldn't be happening if students weren't keen and enthusiastic and passionate to do these things in organizations like PBSC, uh, organizing the opportunities and facilitating. But when you add up all that, is it the individual benefit to that community and that student or that funder or that partner or that firm? Or is there a culture change that you see in the profession as a whole based on all of these efforts uh, in the pro bono access public interest uh, area to build that kind of professional ideal? First, it's, it's beneficial for everybody. The firms have the clients, they like it, they can tell them what they're doing, and so it's good for the firms, good for the students, good for the practitioners, good for everybody. I don't see any, any problem, but there is a trend, and uh, we, can, we cannot buck that trend. Uh, the, I was at the CBA uh, Upper Law Society yesterday, and they, they were thinking about doing things. Everybody, because uh, if people cannot get justice, it's pure injustice. And it, injustice is as bad uh, for a person than not having the, 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 the medical care. It's, 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 on the other side of the equation is people uh, have an inherent need and, and desire for justice. They can't have justice. Some get, uh, some commit suicide. Some, you know, the, the terrible, uh, what it does for society is terrible. So uh, we have to do something. And uh, we, I think the trend is there, and we should continue on that trend to bring justice to the people. I was chairing the, the day after I left the court, January 3, 2003, the Minister of Justice of Quebec, Claire, I'd like your help. I said, what? I'm just retired. I want to relax. I'm retired. <laughs> and they say, he said, well, we have a project what called the House of Justice. It's a pilot project, so we, that would involve volunteer uh, and, and so on, to distribute justice to the people who don't, who don't uh, qualify for legal aid and who don't have enough money for uh, hiring a, a lawyer. So I said, well, that's very interesting. Yes, it didn't take me long to reflect. And um, then I phoned my friends and I said, I get to, hey, would you come and, and spend a day or uh, this and that, uh, li uh, listening to people? And we were not uh, allowed to give advice. But it was just like the tourist kiosk. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You have a problem and it is a uh, landlord tenant. Oh, there is something for you there. We'll, we'll call and we'll, we'll accompany you. So people, uh, my mother is dying. I don't know what to do. Well, there are notaries for that. We'll give you the list and everything. That was extremely successful and we had a survey made for three years, uh, the uh, pilot project. The survey said 97% of satisfaction from our public. We have 45 retired judges, retired lawyers, uh, students who were finishing their schooling. 
uh, that came and spent sometimes uh, a day, sometimes half a day, on the <coughs> telephone and everything. It was an extraordinary exper experience. Uh, after the pilot project, the bar started to be nervous. Because the bar, when they are not involved in everything, uh, they, they throw it against them. So uh, they, they, um, they themselves started a new project exactly the same. Uh, it's called uh, Justice of Proximity. And, uh, and, and they, they, had, they do the same thing. And one thing, you know, I, I told another audience that um, uh, pro bono is the soul of justice. And uh, pro bono is also the nobility of the profession. We cannot, we cannot forget for what we, we are child to render justice. And you go back to Hammurabi, it's for you people that, that I wrote this, this code. So I think uh, essentially we have to keep in mind we don't work for money, we work for justice. Well, uh, and so that, that's a something that I learned in, in school and I practiced all my life. It's just uh, the money is, is good. Sure, we have to live, but it comes at the same time if you look at it differently. It's justice that's going to be rendered, uh, and, and if they can't pay well, we'll see, they pay later. Uh, that's the way to practice. To me, that's the way I practice lot 22 years, and that's the thing I'm so proud of. So you did better than uh, get on the brochure. You helped write it. I literally saw Nikki taking notes, and then I heard Soul of Justice, and I saw the men come out. Look, uh, we would love to, to stay up here all afternoon. We've got time just for a, a last and very quick question. But it's, a, it's a quick question, but not an insignificant one. Uh, and it takes uh, us full circle uh, to, I think, uh, how, how we began and the ways in which you are an inspiration to many in this room, to many more who aren't in this room and come across your writings, your judgments, and, uh, and a bit of your spirit. <laughs> well, they have great footnotes. And you don't see that anymore. But, but here's, the, here's the thing. You inspire many, but not many people know uh, who inspires you. So I want to give you a, a last chance to say a word about someone in the course of your career who has inspired you uh, as, a, again, a, hopefully a segue into everyone in the room continuing uh, to, uh, to move forward to make uh, pro bono the soul of justice and make their own contributions, one that they'll be up here talking about uh, some years from today. Well, my inspiration was my mother. Um, she was educated, she was a concert pianist, she, was a, uh, she wanted us to succeed. She wanted to be a lawyer. That was, uh, she, I was born in 1927. So she wanted to be a lawyer and she always said, it's not just, we have to do something about that. You know, I, justice, I was brought up like with the milk, mother's milk. So that's my inspiration. And interestingly enough, uh, uh, when I was at the Supreme Court, I got a call from, uh, what's her name, from the Lawyers Weekly, uh, Kristen Schmitz. And she said, Claire, we would like to, uh, they, they are reproducing CPAC, our, our uh, television uh, for the court. So she said, I would like people to know who you are. And uh, when I said, OK, I might, but if my colleagues do, not alone. So I, I put it to the, the, the court, and they said, uh, on the condition they don't talk about our judgments, that who they were, where we come from, and everything. So at the end, we all did that one hour, one hour and a half, every Saturday, or whatever it was. And at the end, she phoned me back, and she said, you know something? I can't believe it. Every one of the judges said that their inspiration was their mother. <laughs> so you see how important a mother is. My second uh, mentor, uh, le more, less than inspiration, was Sam Schwartzbarren, who was a minority. There were two Jewish lawyers in Quebec City. None of them uh, had, uh, would and did uh, hire a woman at the time. That was 1952. Um, and he hired me. And without any, any question asked, well, I, was, I was a person. And uh, so to me, and he, he helped me all the way. He, he was more Francophile than I was. And I learned English more with him because our three had sometimes English. So it was an extraordinary experience of 20 years. He, he went on the bench in 1969. So I was, uh, was with him uh, a long time. 
and he would always <laughs> he would say something that uh, never never understood. He said, "Oh, you'll be at the Supreme Court one day. You'll be at the Supreme Court." And I was laughing, of course. It was no possibility. So, so, uh, so I was lucky because this minority, I heard a minority. And I must add that my mother had multiple sclerosis, and she was 50 years in a wheelchair, couldn't eat. Her, she was a pianist, and she had her hands like this. And so, so I learned, I learned about equality a lot about that. You know, it was difficult because it's such an extraordinary mother. She died at 80, and uh, so, uh, so all these experiences they shape you. So the next one that goes to the Supreme Court, be shaped with what? I don't know. 